So what we're going to do is um, have a conversation with, and what's your name, dude? Zach. Zach. And then we're talking with dad. You've interviewed me before. I noticed. I, I'm actually remembering now. Okay, cool. Um, and, and Zach, what's your dad's name? Uh, my dad's name is Dave. My mom's just here to say hi. And okay. Hello, mom. Up. And what's your hi. name, mom? Kim. Okay. Would it be inappropriate if I winked at you? Not at all. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so what we're going to do is um, we're going to talk with Zach, right, first? Yes. And then Dave. And then y'all aren't allowed to watch, okay, when we're talking okay. with Zach. Okay. And then when we're talking with Dave, Zach, you're not allowed to watch. Okay, because presumption of privacy. So everyone on the internet can watch, but y'all can't watch. And then we're going to talk with the two of you together. Does that sound good? Yep. Any questions? Okay, cool. Um, let's get started. So, Zach, let's get started with you, man. So I'll yeah. ask your parents to step out of the room. Get. Yeah, so, Zach, didn't we talk about um, your family dynamics when you came on stream, like, back in March? A little bit. Not a whole lot, but... Okay. Like, briefly. Okay. Yeah, so tell me what's... Um... Oh, yeah, there we go. So tell me... Uh, are your... PhD student? Uh, dropped out. But... Dropped out. That's right. So that's what we talked about, right? Yeah, I remember. How are you doing, man? Uh, doing okay. I took your advice and went and got a therapist and have been talking with her for a couple months. Uh, I joined Great. the group coaching. Um, awesome. Still some like stuff mentally that I have to work out with myself, but I'm kind of making a little bit of progress. Okay, great. So you say you're making a little bit of progress. Yeah. So well, I'm starting to find out that there's a lot of things, right? Yeah. <laughs> it gets more complicated than I thought it was. So Zach, the first thing I'm going to say is that I, th I think this is very common where people, I think you, pro my guess or my hope is that you've made a lot of progress, but it's hard to see that right now. Um, mm -hmm. If you are, if you have been working with a therapist and if you're beginning to see what the road ahead is then chances are you've actually gained a lot of insight. Huh. Um, but you'll, I mean, hopefully that'll become clear in a year or two when you see how far you've come. You know, it's sometimes hard to see like your progress, like day to day. But you look back at yourself like two or three years ago and you'll be like, wow, I was in a really bad spot. And I'm like, actually, okay now. So that's my hope for you. Okay, cool. So tell me a little bit about what's, um, what's going on with uh, your dad or you. And I'm going to just grab my notebook. Hold on. Okay. Um, so this is, it's kind of hard to like specifically say it's with my dad, right? Because this is sort of my whole family. We okay. have a lot of complicated stuff going on. Okay. So tell us um, about that. So I'll start with about a week ago on like Thursday or Friday, my mom came into my room and was like, hey, we need to talk about some stuff. And she just sort of like spilled out to me. Um, her thoughts of how our family was doing, and okay. so I agreed with it. Um, which is that? Oh man, it's so complicated. <laughs> okay. What did so she say to family, you? This was like a couple hour long conversation, but she was telling me that she she started with with it's difficult with my brother. So my brother, my younger brother has autism. He's like four years younger than me. Mm -hmm. And because of COVID and other things that has caused complications for him and has caused him to get a little bit more crazy than he usually is. Okay. Uh, and it's been getting worse and worse and worse to the point that uh, his therapist has told my mom, this needs to be fixed soon because he's bordering on manic, which that's is like pretty severe. That's yeah, frightening. That's, that's, that's very terrifying. <laughs> Um, so there's, how does it, how does it feel yeah. when some, when a therapist tells you this needs to be fixed soon? Oh, that's, that's really bad. Right. Like that feels, it's scary. It's, um, anxiety inducing. Like I've always known that he's got his issues and that we want to fix them, but it's really terrifying to hear that. Like he could be put in a mental hospital if we don't get this dealt with. Like and that's just scary. Yeah. And who's the, who takes like who who is responsible for dealing with it? 
kind of my mom. I mean, my parents together, but I feel like a lot of the pressure is on my mom. Okay. That's kind of interesting because, you know, I, and I'm not blaming anyone, but I kind of think about, you know, if, if someone is bordering on manic and you're their provider, if you're the therapist, like, I don't know exactly what the situation is. And I know a lot, especially with autism has to do with the home environment, but like, generally speaking, I, I would think that that's, you know, if I had a patient who is bordering on manic, like, I think I'm kind of responsible for that. No. Is the doctor. Yeah. <laughs> it's my personal take on this is kind of all over the place. I think that he doesn't have the best therapists. Um, okay. But then, so this is where I sort of link a little bit back to my dad is I think he's part of the problem. Okay. I don't think so. he's the only part. I, I think there's a lot of elements again, COVID, but I think that he's part of it because he's a very type A personality. He's about rules. He's about um, strictness and schedules and hitting things to the letter. And autism does not fit well into that structure. And so okay. if, you know, we plan something and we don't warn my brother adequately enough, he'll freak out about it. That's just what he does. And then my dad will get mad at him and try to force rules on him and try to force the structure onto him and say, we have to do this. You can't follow your patterns. You have to go do this. And okay. like, I can see kind of where he's coming from, that it's very hard to work with a child like this who will like half the time not care what you say and not do what you say. And they like to fight a lot. Um, but as the parent, it's on you to work around that. You had the child, you're supposed to raise them. If they're going to be troublesome, then you have to be accepting of that, not fight with them and yell at them and make it worse. Okay. Okay. So Zach, can I just share some like thoughts? I know I should ask you more questions. Mm -hmm. um, but the first thing is that like all that, like I agree with you a hundred percent, but bluntly all that shit goes out the window when you have a kid with autism. Because yeah. it is just so hard. Yeah. And and it's just like, yeah. So so I, I don't disagree with what you say. And at the same time, having worked with parents who have autistic kids, it's tough. Like they, it tests. Yeah. It, I mean, it's, it's yeah. just hard. I lived with him for 18 years. So yeah. <laughs> so, you know. What's it like to live with him? Uh, it's been different at different points. Uh, so when I was younger, so like before I left for college and everything, um, it was it was really hard because he was going through puberty and so hormones start to mess with him and he just gets like kind of all over the place and like unpredictable as heck. Um. I mostly just like tried to not interact with them because it was really hard to know when it would be a positive or when it would be a negative interaction and use it was a negative interaction. Um, was, what does that mean? It would, it, it would usually lead to fighting of some kind. Like it was really hard to be able to relate to him in any way to have a conversation. And again, he has autism. So like he doesn't think normally. And so like having a conversation he's just like following formulas. He's not like trying to communicate with you. Mm -hmm. um, and so like, it wasn't really, there wasn't really much of a point to it. And it would mostly just always devolve to him saying something. I don't, I don't even know why this has been so many years. I've lost track of what it was like, but it would just like result in fighting of some kind. So you like rolled your eyes there. Do you know what, do you know what the emotion there is? No. <laughs> How'd you feel as you were, as you were thinking about what it was like to try to communicate with your brother? Um, I don't know. It was just really hard. And like, yeah. Can I toss out a couple of words? Yeah. Exhausted? Yeah. Yep. Defeated? Yep. Yes. Mm -hmm. It's defeated. <laughs> yes. That's, if you guys were watching that facial expression that Zach did, that is the facial expression of defeat. It's, it's, and, and we can kind of see that. I'm sorry, Zach, if I'm kind of diving right in, but like, you know, I can, I can see kind of where you're coming from because what we're hearing from you is that like you tried to interact with your brother, 
But part of the problem with autism is that he like literally doesn't know how to communicate. Yeah. And so like you can try, but like, it's just going to kind of bounce off. And in, in a sense, it can feel like no matter how hard you try, you end up fighting anyway. And then you're kind of defeated. Yeah. So sorry for kind of going down yeah. all these different roads, but it sounds tough, dude. Like it sounds actually really, really hard. Yeah. So it was, it was really hard uh, at that age. I mean, there was some like made like big specific moments. I can remember there was one point where I don't remember what happened, but somehow he got really angry at me and he grabbed one of the kitchen knives and started chasing me around the house. I was like 12 years old being chased by an eight year old with a knife. I was freaking out. Uh, there was one time we got in an argument and he shoved me and I fell through a glass table and got caught up on my arms and everything. I mean, this is like, there was, there was crazy things that happened, but I went to college. I got away from the family for however many years, four, five, six years. Um, and then when I came back and I was watching your streams and stuff, I decided to like try and interact with him as if he's a human rather than as if he's this disabled person. And it went from before I was the person that absolutely couldn't interact with him. And he like pretty much hated me and I pretty much hated him to where now I'm the only person in the family who can like pretty much talk to him normally. And he will kind of do what I say. He doesn't care at all what my parents say anymore. So it's almost like the roles have been reversed. Hold on. <laughs> so much confusion there. Okay. So yeah. The first thing. Is how the fuck is that a little bit of progress on your part? <laughs> Number one. Okay. So we don't have to go down that road, but like, can we just appreciate for a moment that also like, what the fuck does that have to do with watching our streams? Cause I don't, anyway, that's another question, which we yeah. can answer on a different day. I don't know if that's relevant. Um, I mean, I'm happy. Is what and, it was. And, and the third thing, and this is, I think what is important is like, how do you feel about that? There's some mixed emotions to that. Part of it is happiness that like, I was able to connect with him. Um, and, and it's like, it's like I was being an asshole to him before. And now I'm not right. Like he really struggles to communicate and I'm able to like, at least to a small degree, help him with that so this is important zach why do you think i'm not judging you for it because this is important why do you think you were an asshole to him before <laughs> where does assholery come from i was just i was really impatient with a lot of, i was like trying to do as high school kids do and deal with high school dumb stupid things and i didn't at least in my mind i didn't have the time to deal with this crazy child who was being a nuisance and bothering me all the time and so i would just be very rude to him and put off things um oh I, I was just it's really hard to like give specific details but in general just kind of a dick <laughs> yeah so i think that's an important discussion also one that we don't have to dig into today but I think a lot of people who are, are, are have asshole kind of behavior, there's some reason like that you don't even understand about why you treated him that way. But something has changed in you where you're treating him a different way. And, and I don't know what that is. It sounds like that's awesome. And it sounds like he's lucky to have a brother who is thoughtful about the way that like you choose to interact with him and that you make effort to treat him not as a disabled person, but also not as a normal human being, but you treat him as him. And, and your brother is incredibly lucky to have someone like that in their, in their life. I cannot impress that upon you enough. Um, but let's keep going. Am I jumping in too much? Uh, no. Okay. So you were mean to him. So now he communicates only with you you have happiness because you used to be an asshole to him. And what other emotions do you have? Um, I also feel a little bit upset because I feel a little bit upset about like how 
my parents can't do the same thing, at least not right now. Okay. Um, so let's unpack that a little bit. What does upset mean? Frustrated, uh, okay. angry. Angry at what? Those are all umbrella emotions, which means they're hiding <laughs> other emotions. I'm disappointed, Great. I guess. There we go. Disappointed in what? That I'm some stupid kid who was able to come to this realization that I was making mistakes and then I was able to adjust that and fix that. Okay. And that happens despite the fact that they're supposed to be like the knowledgeable parents. There we go. There's a key word there. They're supposed to. Okay. I'm a stupid kid. Okay. Zach, there's a ton there. Can we analyze as we go or do you want like, you want me to hear your story first? Um, think about that. I guess I'm kind of curious how we'll be able to get through everything if we're analyzing along the that's, way. That's the concern. Yeah. So then let's just, okay, I'm going to do one more analytical piece and then we'll get through everything. Okay. So the first thing is that your disappointment. So I think you blame your parents. What do you think? Yeah. Right. So there's disappointment. And that also is like a little bit more politically correct than blame. But what I'm hearing from you is that you blame your parents for not figuring out what you figured out. So there's, there's something also there where you say, I'm a stupid kid. I don't think you're a stupid kid. I think you grossly underestimate the value of what you've accomplished because some autistic people go their entire life without having someone in their life who does what you did. Because what you did is not easy. It's fucking hard. Um, and yeah, and I think that you have to be careful because as long as you see what you do is easy, you're going to resent your parents more. Okay. What do you think about that? That's interesting because you were saying that it's really hard and I was thinking to myself, it doesn't feel that hard. It feels pretty easy, but if you... When you reframe it that way, that's interesting. Yep. So I, we can continue thinking about that. And, and I would just really ask you to, I know it feels easy to you, but just stop and think for a second about how easy it is to effectively communicate with an autistic adult. Yeah. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> right? <laughs> so, so don't confuse you being really good at something with the fact that it's easy. Okay. Uh, but we'll, we'll get to that. Anyway, I promise I'll sh shut up now and, and I'll hear the rest of your story. Uh, okay. So, so you feel favorite. blame, you feel happiness. What else? Um, those are kind of the main things I would think. I, I also kind of feel bad for him, right? Because mm -hmm. I almost imagine having autism. I don't know. I mean, we don't know a whole lot about it, right? So it's difficult to but I almost imagine it as you are a normal person trapped in this strange mind that you can't control. Um, mm -hmm. And so he's trying to find outlets and trying to help himself in that way, I think. Yep. I don't really know through, but I think. Um, and he's just trying to, I mean, he's almost just trying to be normal, right? Mm -hmm. He just wants to experience what other people experience. And... I mean, for one, it's really frustrating to not be able to do that because of your own limitations. But I also feel it's very frustrating to not be able to do that because of other people around you not understanding. Like, one of the things that I hate the most is when someone misunderstands me. And to have that always happening constantly, like, that'd be awful. Yeah. So it sounds so, like you feel kind of sad for him. Yeah. Um, do you feel burdened at all that, like, you've kind of become the last best hope for him? I don't know. I mean, a, a little bit, because I'm actually planning to go to leave once COVID goes down. I want to, like, move to Japan. And so I'll be like, see ya. Okay. <laughs> right? Like, I feel a little bad about it. But I don't know. I, I, I also kind of don't really feel that burdened by it it's just okay. sort of like i'm being here for him while i can be and hopefully i can get my parents to realize the same thing and then realize can, what well, well sort of like realize the same things that i have about okay about how to interact yeah how to interact with them i guess how do your parents feel about you piecing out after i haven't told them 
<laughs> okay. Because I came to this realization like a week or two ago. Okay. And it's still sort of like a plan in my head that I haven't really like done anything about yet. But it, I'm, the more and more I sit on it, the more and more I'm like set on it and I like, really want to do it. So, okay. Sounds like you've made a lot of progress, man. I know, right? I, I, I feel like now I'm, I was exaggerating when I said a little, but. Yep. So that has something to do with your con- your perception of your own confidence, but. Oh, yeah. Yes. Yeah. When I was saying earlier about there's a lot of things I need to focus on, so that's sort of what I mean. Okay. So now we sort of get your perspective. So what's going on in the family or what was the conversation when, yeah. So fill me in a little bit about the conversation that you and your mom had. Tell me about your dad or tell me about the therapist saying he's bordering on manic, whichever one you think is better. Um, I'll just can try and continue this conversation. If I can remember a, a, a lot of the conversation was her explaining to me her perspective on a situation that had happened earlier. So we had some, my parents had hired window cleaners to come to our house and clean the windows. Um, my, they were burdened with whatever was going on. They were thinking about some crazy stuff. So they didn't get to tell me or my brother until the night before that, Hey, the, the window actually, they told me, but they didn't tell my brother, I think. And so I had, I knew that I was going to wake up in the morning and there's going to be windows cleaners there. And there's going to be some crazy stuff going on in the house. My brother didn't. Um, and so I'm sleeping in until like 11 or whatever, as I usually do. The window cleaners are here. My mom was telling me that my dad, since he's about like timing and rules and all this stuff, is starting to get anxious because we need to move stuff away from the windows so that they could clean it. Okay. Which is just being nice to them. They were going to probably move things anyways, but he wanted to make sure that everything was out of the way for them. So he was getting anxious about that. And he was putting that anxiety on her because she tends to be receptive to other people's feelings and he tends to put his feelings onto other people. Okay. Um, and so she was getting anxiety from him. And so she came into my room to wake me up, to move some stuff around, to get me to help. And then she went to tell my brother, who didn't know, and as an autistic person, that's going to upset him. And so she started moving things in his room. He started freaking out, and then he started to melt them, which eventually later in the day resulted in him screaming, fuck you, to the painters. And my parents were worried that he was actually going to go out and push one of them off the ladder or something. Because like he was going crazy. Um, and in all of this, my dad was, again, trying to enforce rules on him. So we have this screaming 20-year-old, 300-pound guy who has autism. You have my dad trying to say, you can't do that. You just need to calm down and let them clean your windows. You have my mom in the middle, like, freaking out, not knowing what to do, trying to get everyone to calm down. And then you have me downstairs in the basement playing video games, trying to shut out all the noise. <laughs> Uh, and so she was conveying all of this to me from her perspective. Um, and that was like a lot of what she was talking about. And then she started laying more of her other stuff problems on about how like her parents were coming over the next day. Um, and her parents are alcoholics and she struggles with that. And then we sounds ended like up she, talking. Sounds like she yeah. depends on you for a lot. And I... I don't know, because this was like, she doesn't usually talk to me about these kind of things. I see. So this okay. was like, yeah, she, this was like the first time that I had had any sort of conversation like this with her in, uh, since I had depression. Like, she came out to visit me while I was in Utah, and that was the last time we had a conversation like this. So, actually, then then I would, I mean, do you think she, hmm, okay, so that's not a regular occurrence. So it sounds like no. she doesn't depend on you much. I don't think she does. Okay. Well, I mean, she, kind of weird right because we talk to each other very familiarly familiarly and we will have conversations where we try not to like let my dad or my brother over here i don't have those kind of conversations with my dad or my brother i only have those conversations with my mom just like the very close interpersonal stuff so so what, I, what makes it more... huh to a degree, I think she kind of does depend on me for that connection, but I wouldn't okay. say that she depends on like spilling everything. Sure. It's really So it, it sounds like you guys are just like just close family. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, and what makes it hard for you to have those kinds of conversations with your dad? He is like virtually impossible to talk to about any of that. Because again, type 
like very hyper type A personality. He's an engineer to his core. Okay. Um, so feelings do not compute, right? Okay. Um, and part of what came up in my this conversation with my mom is she was talking about how he's sort of always been this way. He was raised this way. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I actually know very little about him or what happened in his childhood, but the way that she conveyed to me is that his family was like this. They weren't very connected to each other. Um, it was a difficult household. And then, I mean, once he hit college, he joined ROTC. So he was military for like 30 years, which again, instills this, like you follow the rules of the leader. You don't disobey who's in command. And now he's in command. And so he's very much in this way of, yeah. Would you say you're, that your dad is oppressive? In ways, yeah. It's that's it's really hard to say because it's very complicated, right? But sure, I'm just asking if that's how it feels. And what I'm basically getting is not really. Yes and no. Again, it's I. It's hard to say how it feels. Because on, I guess I'll give you an example. So last night. I was scrolling through Discord and saw somebody type the command for when does the live stream go up? And it was midnight and I saw 11 hours and I thought, I thought it was at one o'clock. And then I realized, no, I got the time conversion wrong. It was at 11 o'clock. And so I had to go into my parents' room to tell them as they were trying to go to sleep that I messed it up and it was actually at the wrong time. And I felt anxious about having to explain that to my dad. I felt like he was either going to be upset or he was going to try to cancel or something like that. Not at all what happened. He took it totally fine and everything was okay. But I felt like that. Mm -hmm. So if that mm -hmm. helps communicate to you how I feel around him in any way. It, it, I mean, that scenario sounds to me like it's almost like the same way that you interact with your brother, which is like, like you, you've learned the lesson that telling your dad that things are changing leads to badness yeah so it, i think oppressive isn't the right word i mean it sounds like it sounds like you're playing with fire sorry what it's not, it feels to me like you're playing with fire you know like you, you don't yeah. know when it's gonna blow the way my mom has described it is like walking on eggshells your dad gets angry? Yes. What do, what does he do when he gets angry? Uh he does this like very cold, not talk to anybody. Um he has this like angry look of his face and he just like does whatever he does and he's usually like kind of so aggressive with it. So like if he's eating food, he'll like aggressively cut with the knife or whatever. Um, and then if anybody like talks too loudly or addresses him incorrectly, then he'll like, instead of responding, I don't know, in a nice way, he responds in an angry way, whether that's like very agitated or yelling or anything like that. When he, yeah. What's it like to live with someone like that? Yeah, it's really hard, dude. <laughs> um, for a while, there was it was like every other day when we would eat dinner, my brother would say something or have a pattern or something. My dad would get mad at him. He would get mad at my dad. And then they would yell at each other. And I'm just trying to sit there and eat food. Like, Dude. Yeah. yeah. Zach, do you think of yourself as resilient? No. <laughs> okay i understand that that makes perfect sense to me and yet i'm gonna ask you <laughs> how would you describe someone who sits there and tries to eat their food is on a daily basis two members of their family are constantly exploding at each other you're probably resilient right it's yeah. weird right? it's fucking weird it's i'm with you man <laughs> and Okay. Yeah, that sounds that sounds like I mean really hard is like the understatement of the year. Mm -hmm. uh, honestly, it feels to me I, I would feel 
like I, it would be impossible for me to do what you do. Like it feels impossible to me. Yeah. I mean, it's kind of hard cause I don't know what to do. Right. Like mm -hmm. if I don't like, okay, if I don't want to do it, if I don't want to be resilient, well, what do I do? Like, I don't really have any option. Mm -hmm. So I kind of have to deal with it. Yep. But yeah. I can kind of see where you're coming from. Yeah. I, I, like, I don't know what you like. I, it sounds, it sounds like an impossible situation. Feels like an impossible situation. Yeah. What do you do about that? I have no fucking idea. Sit downstairs and play video games. That's fun. <laughs> right on. <laughs> That's the right answer. Um, yeah, man. By the way, the examples that you offer are really, really helpful. Are they? Okay, good. Yeah, I, I think I think they capture a lot. You know, you're like painting a picture and like sort of a picture is worth a thousand words. So a lot of these dynamics, I think, are very helpful. Um. Do you feel like you've given us kind of like a sufficient picture or are there other things that you want to add? I, there's nothing that I can like specifically add. I don't think it really encompasses everything, but it'd be really hard to, because it's a whole lot of, you know, more examples of similar situations that I just can't remember sure. um, or like small things here and there that again, they're just like, it's, it's too difficult to like really explain the whole, the whole of it, but that's about as good of a picture as I can give. Okay. Um, can I try to sum up what I heard and then maybe okay. we can fill in gaps? Okay, sure. Um, and then maybe we can talk about your dad a little bit more, but okay. So your parents have two sons. You're mm -hmm. the older son. Mm -hmm. You're, I understand that you don't view yourself as very competent, but we know that there's con there's evidence to the contrary let's put it that way right okay. so like you were in a pretty competitive phd program you ended up dropping out slash getting kicked out had a toxic advisor things like that you thought that your toxic advisor and for people who i guess i'm surprised i remember but you know you thought that everything that your advisor was doing to you i think towards the end you really realized that it's not really your fault that your advisor was actually pretty bad but I can imagine that that would be a pretty severe blow to your confidence. So you kind of come home, you have a younger brother who's autistic. Um, it sounds like early on, maybe things were sort of okay, but then as he start, started to grow and you started to grow, it became very, very difficult to interact with him. Um, it sounds to me like your parents sort of did the best that they could, but when your dad kind of is in crisis mode, he goes back to what he knows which is control structure, right? When there's a problem, like you, you rely on systems, resources, and rules to kind of deal with it. There's not a whole lot of fluidity. Mm -hmm. So it also sounds like he gets anxious actually pretty easily. And the way that he responds to his own anxiety is control. So when he gets mm -hmm. anxious, he tries to control shit. Yes. And it sounds like he also recruits your mom to be one of his tools to leverage control in the household. Yes. And because she is somewhat conflict avoidant, she kind of gives in because she's walking on eggshells and doesn't want to, you know, doesn't want to step on any eggs and want to end up with yolk on the floor. So everyone sort of listens to your dad because he kind of like, he sort of runs the show as pretty controlling. If you don't listen to your dad, maybe there's not a whole lot of like dialogue. There's not a whole lot of like opinions or like, hey, dad, they can move the stuff themselves. Like he's not really in a space to sort of hear that kind of thing. Yeah. Um, and then we kind of come to your, so it sounds like you and your mom are close, right? So you guys can connect with each other because both of y'all are sort of like talkers or feelers. Mm -hmm. And it, it, it seems like your dad and your brother have difficulty engaging on that wavelength. Yeah. So I'm not really detecting any amount of kind of like reverse parenting. So sometimes we get into situations where parents become the children and children become the parents. And yeah, like, that's... I'm not getting any of that. So it doesn't sound like your mom leans on you for her emotional needs. It sounds like you guys, like you're an adult and she's an adult 
and y'all are close family members, y'all understand each other, y'all love each other, and y'all just have a strong relationship where there's pretty even flow of communication. Yeah. Um, then we come to your brother. So your brother is autistic. It's unclear to me exactly where he is in terms of function, but it sounds like he's like kind of functional, but has a lot of difficulty managing his own emotions and and can kind of be okay if he's got a routine. Mm -hmm. But I'm not hearing that he's like nonverbal or, or or things like that, that like, you know, his emotions escalate pretty easily. He doesn't respond well to routine, but you can communicate with him. He does to a certain degree appreciate communication. Yeah. I mean, we used to joke because the, when he was first diagnosed, they said that he would be nonverbal. And now we joke that he's overly verbal. Yeah. That's yeah. great. I mean, that's actually a huge, that's a huge win, whether y'all realize it or not, which I think it's hard for you guys to realize, but, um, you know, having a autistic kid who becomes verbal is like really amazing. And, and it's a testament to what your family has accomplished, which it may not seem like that right now, but you know, I've seen other cases where nonverbal kids end up nonverbal. Um, and that also doesn't mean that their families didn't try hard enough, which is what's really hard about autism. But I think you guys really deserve a pat on the back for, um, you know, what y'all have done for him. So then the other thing that I'm going to kind of hypothesize a little bit is, is, you know, it sounds like your brother's autism and your dad's desire for control are sort of like oil and water. Like that just sounds bad. Yeah. <laughs> I I sort of liken it to two autistic people with very different patterns trying to mesh those patterns together. Like that just will not happen at all. So t tell me a little bit about, you know, how they don't mesh or why they don't mesh. And I'm guessing uh, I can phrase the question slightly differently. What's the cycle? Because it sounds like there's a cycle in there. But mm, let me tell think. me about so their interactions. So my brother has like 8 billion different little patterns he goes through on a regular basis. Um, and my dad will come up with something, whether it's dinner time or we go somewhere or there's work that needs to be done or someone's coming to fix the house in some way, whatever. Something needs to happen. And then that does not agree with the pattern of my brother. So like often what happens is my dad will get frustrated that it's dinner time, but my brother has to go walk the dog right now because that's his pattern. And so there's conflict there. Um, and so my dad will say like, well, why didn't you do it earlier? Or why don't you do it after? And my brother would say, well, I, because I want to do it now. And then my dad will um, either roll his eyes and go, Ugh, and then be like, whatever, or he'll fight with him. Um, and he'll say like, no, you have to do X now. You need to do it now. This needs to happen. And then my brother will yell and scream and then start fighting. And then at that point, communication breaks down and it's just ang arguing people, not even like aiming at each other. It's just like craziness. Yeah. So the cycle is like the, my brother is always in his constant state of like existing in his patterns. And if my dad has something that needs to happen, they, they both have this thing that needs to happen, but they can't happen together. Like they just can't coexist. And so then disagreement comes from there. Okay. And so, so is, would it be fair for me to assume that the more conflict arises, the more your dad doubles down on control Yeah. and the more he doubles down on control, the more conflict arises. Yes. Do so if your dad, your dad sometimes gives up and accepts defeat. Does your brother do that? Does your dad ever win? No, no, he doesn't. Okay. Okay. So, I mean, do you feel like we have a pretty good picture of what these dynamics are like? Yeah. Uh, when you were laying it out, it was, I felt like it was better than the way I tried to lay it out. Like you, you really nope. hit the nail on the head. Nope, buddy, you laid it out. I'm just okay. telling you what I heard. <laughs> okay. Um, I think you, like I said, you gave a lot of very, very illustrated, illustrative actual examples that captured a lot of that essence very well um so what help me understand a little bit about like 
you know, why are we here today? So like, what's, what's the goal of like having you and your dad come on? Cause I'm not hearing any communication issues between you and your dad. Yeah. Uh, I'm not fully sure, um, <laughs> to be honest. Cause okay. so when my mom came in and had this conversation with me. That's when I remembered that you guys were looking for families to come on. And that's when I messaged French, Hey, I got a family that needs to come on. <laughs> And after going back and forth, he said that you wanted to have only like two people come on to yep. more direct and yep. be like, let's have you and your dad come on. I was like, all right, cool. Okay. So, here we are. Um, so, so what do you, what, what do you, what, what would you like to change about your family dynamic? Oh, that's a good question. Uh, I mean, there's a couple things for one, I would like my parents to have a better understanding of my brother and to be how do I put this? I want them to be less likely to conflict with them, right? Like I this whole thing with my dad doubling down on control and him getting more angry and my dad doubling down again and then him getting more angry. Like that's obvious to me. I want that to be obvious to him so that he doesn't do that anymore a for me because i can't have constant yelling in my life b for my mom because she also needs peace c for my brother so that he doesn't have this constant conflict and d for my dad because i mean like i've said my dad was raised in this very like rules way and i don't think that's good for him or for anybody in the family okay um and i think I, that's actually i think that'd be such a to somehow find a way to slowly break him out of that because that would solve so many different things. Break him out of what? This this uh, rules based, very strict style that he has always been. Okay. Uh, so what we want to do is change him as a human being. Well, yeah, yeah. That, <laughs> I, 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 like, no, no, no. But hey, I asked you. I asked you what do you want to change. That's cool. Because it's re like I Beach like I said, stars, bro. I have no connection with my dad whatsoever i don't know if i've ever really like wanted one because i have never really like experienced that in any way we just have never connected with each other really hardly at all um whereas i have been able to connect and be pretty friendly with my mom and i like that connection so if there were some way to have that with my dad i don't know if that's practical or possible or if that's even something that i really want but okay um uh, has your dad ever seen a therapist no nope He's always looked at it as psychological mumbo jumbo. Ignore that crap. <laughs> it's hard to get him into this. <laughs> well, hey, so like strong work with getting him here, right? Like that's that's he deserves he deserves some props for showing up. Yeah. Oh, I forgot to mention when I was talking to my mom in here, um, she had mentioned to me that she brought up family counseling with my dad, and it was the first time that he had agreed that this is maybe something we should do. So he's like kind of starting to go a little bit in that direction. Okay. Any questions for me, Zach? I don't know. I don't have anything come to mind right now. I mean, I feel like we got to talk to your dad, bro. Yeah. Like, I think you've laid out a pretty good picture. Uh, thankfully, since we've talked before, I know a little bit about you. Uh-oh, are we lagging? Okay. Um, but I, I think a lot of this has to come from your dad's perspective, and then we'll get both of you all in together. Does that sound good to you? Yeah. Let's swap. And no watching, okay? Okay, I'm okay. gonna find them. <laughs> All right. All right, Twitch chat. How you guys? Is this sound like a good use of our time on stream? Hey, Dr. K. Hey, Dave. How are you? Good. How are you? Uh, I'm doing well, man. Um, how do you feel about doing this? Um, I've never done it before. A uh, little uncomfortable. 
Just a little? Okay, quite a bit. <laughs> <laughs> I can imagine, right? Let's let's just call yeah, it what it is, you know? Yeah, I won't hide it. Yeah. And, um, you know, I've, I've had experiences in standing up and briefing uh, small and large groups of people. <clears throat> so it's kind of in the same realm. I haven't done that for a long time. But um, it's one of those things, uh, the more you do it, the more you become comfortable with it. Sure. Particularly if you fully understand the subject matter. And here I don't, because I don't know where you're coming from. <laughs> sure. So so maybe I can help you there. Would you like to hear where I'm coming from? Sure. Okay. So I'm going to kind of zoom out a little bit, okay? And tell you a little bit about what we do here. So I'm. Uh, we tend to just talk to people on the internet. Because it's been my experience that like people share a lot of the same challenges in life and that by talking to one person, like I basically have the same conversations with a lot of different people. And so what we do here is we have conversations with people that other people watch because I can imagine that you have um, or y'all's family has some amount of conflict or maybe some kind of difficulty communication communicating. And that is also true of every other family in the history of human existence. And so the reason that we're here today is to see if that there's something we can help you guys do to maybe communicate a little bit better, maybe to be uh, to understand each other a little bit better, um, understand how the the dynamics of the family unit works, right? So like it's a big I have a big belief that in order to change something you have to understand how it works. So what we're really here to do today is to try to understand a little bit about what's going on. Um, in you, in your family, and in the interface between those two things. How does that sound? Sounds sound? good. Sounds okay. good. So can you tell me a little bit about, um, so Zach had mentioned that there's been like, you know, tensions have been running high in the house recently. Um, would you agree with that? Yes. Can you help me understand a, a little bit about what your perception of that is? Um. Part of it, I'll say there's been a change in the family dynamics in the recent months, partially due to COVID. Absolutely. In the fact that um, in a normal day pre-COVID, I was at work. My wife works from home. And our son was in school. And he would normally get home about 2.30. Uh, since COVID... Um, I'm working from home for the past four months. Uh, our other child, the one that Car Zach had mentioned was uh, autistic. Uh, he's home now full time. And, and Zach's been home full time. So everybody's home 24 seven. And it's been a drastic change for the autistic son. And that his normal daily routine has been disturbed and he's trying to find himself with new routines and he really he's he's a little unique autistic kid in the way that he is social mm -hmm. where most are not social and he misses that social interaction that he gets riding the bus and with his teachers and peers in his school he's in a uh, transition program uh, he graduated from high school, but they hold the diploma until he completes a, a two-year transition program to help set him up for employment or some oh, wow. other opportunity. Okay. And so our district offers that, and it's a real good program. So he will come to, uh, to the end of that program here in December. But in any case, his normal routine and social interaction is, has not been happening the last four months. And so that's caused a, a drastic behavior change in him. Okay. So that's added, added stress. Yeah, so I was just going to say, that sounds like a pretty hefty stressor on yes. the system of your family. Yes. How does that stress manifest? Uh, with the, the autistic son, I'll, I'll let you, his name is Carson. Okay. He uh, is had more meltdowns, become more difficult to manage his behavior. He's very obsessed with patterns. And if he can't do his patterns the way he wants to, for various reasons, whether the weather interferes with him going outside and walking the dog, or 
um, some other interference as a result of family activities, perhaps, they'll have a meltdown and that disturbs the family. It can evolve into shouting and yelling and it takes us 30 to 40 minutes to calm him down to where he can reason through the situation at hand. Okay. So tell me what a meltdown, you kind of mentioned this a little bit. When you say he has more meltdowns, like tell us, tell me or us what a meltdown looks like. He becomes uh, uncontrollable verbally and emotionally. He'll start yelling. He will make statements that are unclear and don't make any sense and he can become very physical and um he is 6'3 240 so he's bigger than mom and dad so that becomes a concern and so the key here is de-escalation and to talk him down and to get him calm that you can reason through the situation and um it, it can be very very challenging and draining for both mom and dad and, and obviously Zach as well too. How do you de-escalate him? Talking, continually talking and talk him down. Help me un understand what that looked like. Um, patience, we have to stay calm even though we may be exhausted and stressed Sounds like we it's have, an exhausting situation. It is mentally, and it can't be physically because uh, this can happen late at night. You know, when we're ready to go to bed, he can have a meltdown at 1130 at night and it'll take us, you know, an hour and a half to get him situated and, and ready for bed, for example. And um, it's, it's uh, being patient and us remaining calm and talking him down and from the situation and trying to reason through it. What are the words that you use to talk him down or reason through the situation? Can you give us an example? One is breathing. Get him to take deep breaths and try to calm himself down physically and hopefully, and then eventually mentally as well so he can think rationally. And uh, you know the adrenaline kicks in and um, he can get spun up physically and, and uh, mentally pretty rapid. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, what do you, what do you say? What do I was going to say one thing is, we, is that we have, uh, you know, he has counselors and, and therapists. It, we're uh, wanting to get family training to know how to work with him and understand what his triggers are. That sounds like a great idea. Um, so wh what do you say? When, when he gets wound up? Whatever the situation is, is, is to talk through that situation and um, very elementary terms and let him try to understand there's not any consequence in not doing one of his patterns. And for example, it may be he has patterns that he does during the day and it delays him to take the dog out for a walk. That's one of his uh, things he loves to do. It's one of his patterns. And if the weather rolls in and it starts raining, then he's in conflict that he can't do his pattern. He, he wants to do it, but he can't because it's raining. And so he's in a do loop and he can't get out of it. And so we try to come up with alternatives to say, let's wait till the rain passes or two tomorrow, knowing that a storm is coming in the afternoon, let's change your pattern and walk the dog in the morning. And so we try to reason through alternatives to permit him to complete his pattern. Okay. Okay. And, and how does it, how do you manage all of this stress or yeah, how how do you manage that? I mean, it sounds so exhausting. sort of decompress. <laughs> no, I mean, just sure decompress, but also like, how do you manage things in the moment? You know, how, how do you feel when it's eleven thirty at night? And well, it's, that that scenario is very difficult at night because uh, I, I get it. 
you know, about nine o'clock, I'm starting to get tired. And if we're watching something on TV and uh, he starts to have a meltdown, you know, at 10, 11 o'clock at night, um, you, you have to regain your composure. And, and uh, what, is, what, what does that mean? Regain your composure? What is what is losing composure look and feel? Well, like? Regaining, should say, regain some strength, get some endurance that you may be out of gas by the end of the day, but need to um, dig deep. And, and get the strength to get you through the period it takes to get, to calm him down from, from a potential meltdown. Okay. What happens, what happens if you dig deep and there's nothing there, nothing left? Then at, at some point I've lost it. And so is my wife. And there's, you know, there's a threshold that we all have. Absolutely. And we've learned that, uh, both parents, or one parent and, and, and Carson um, shouting and yelling and, and getting into an escalation is of no value to anybody. We've learned that. So again, the key is, is you got to gain composure, get your mind together and realize we got to deescalate and think through quickly how you can provide alternatives and rationalize with them to calm them down. Can I think for a second, Dave? Sure. It's going to take me a minute, okay? Sure. I'm just going to, I'm trying to process everything that you've said, really kind of pay attention to it, really try to understand, you know, the inputs that you're offering us and integrating it a little bit with some of what your son has said. So the first thing that I, I want to point out is that a lot of what you're saying, like you use a lot of like language of necessity. So you say, you gotta, you need to, you have to, you gotta dig deep, you gotta find strength. Does that make sense? Yeah. And... And I know this may sound kind of weird, but like what needs to be done is like quite different from how it feels in the moment, right? It's sort of like looking forward. Does that make sense? The end state? Yes. So you're focusing on the end state. You're focusing on the goal. Right. Do you think there's value to focusing on things besides the goal, like how you feel in the moment? Sure. What's the value in that? Short-term results. What does that mean? Small steps to get to your goal. Take one step at a time. And it could be calm yourself down first before you can help someone else. Okay. So it seems like the value of like your emotions, understanding your emotions is so that you can master them so that you can get to your end goal. Yes. So the only value that I'm really hearing from you about understanding, let's say the way that you feel in the moment is because that's going to help you get to your end goal. Is that fair? Yeah. Okay. So I don't know how exactly to explain this, so I'm going to think about it for a little while and I'm going to ask you some more questions. But in my experience, there's value to knowing what you feel independent of it getting you to your goal. What do you think about that? Yeah. That how you feel and what... You, how you feel in the moment is important. And that can influence, I guess, the outcome. Sure. Your goal. So, so what I'm wondering is, is there importance if it doesn't influence your outcome? No, no I haven't thought about that. Hmm. What do you think? So explain that a little bit more. So let me think about that. Yeah. Well, 
Well, let me just try to come up with an example. So I'm going to use a slightly dire example. So, and, and maybe there's, I'm sure there's an outcome somewhere here. So let's say that I have someone who has cancer and that the cancer is terminal. Like understanding that the cancer is terminal changes nothing about the fact that the person is going to die. And yet, just understanding that you have terminal cancer can change something within you. Like it has value. Right. And, and so you could say that there's an outcome there, too, which is that you spend your, the rest of your life in a slightly different way. So I, I'm sort of always seeing an outcome. But oddly enough, as someone who's worked with terminal cancer patients, I've observed that even if it doesn't change something about their life or it doesn't lead to a goal, that understanding how you feel and understanding what the situation is in and of itself has value. Does that make sense? Yes. I see where you go. So another example is like when I think about a flower, like, and I look at a flower and I think, oh, that flower is beautiful. There's no goal there. There's no like, there's no outcome. And understanding that I appreciate flowers and like just watching a flower and appreciating it for what it is can have value, but there's not really a goal. Does that make sense? Yeah. I see what you're saying. And, and so w when you say you see what I'm saying, what, what do you think I'm saying? What do you see? Because I, I don't even know what I'm saying. <laughs> so help us not out. Everything, not everything has to contribute to a goal. And you can enjoy the moment for whatever value it provides you. Okay. If it's entertainment, fulfillment, happiness. Sure. So, uh, so that's, that's a really um, great way to put it, Dave. So let me ask you actually another question. It sounds like appreciating the moment without a goal is important if it has a positive direction. So happiness, joy, beauty. What about negative things? I guess it'd be undesirable and less... Unless there is some value in it, I can't think of an example now where okay. a negative negative uh, outcome in the, in a moment like that would have value. Except that if it was negative, maybe you learn from it. Sure. Yeah. Okay. The learning experience. Yeah. So um, the best thing that I can kind of think of is in terms of a negative thing is like what I think of is like the gr grieving process. Right. So like grieving is sort of this weird thing where sure, you can also see outcomes because after grieving, you're no, maybe less sad or no longer sad or something like that. But I, I think that there's just value in people like grieving together and just acknowledging that there's been some kind of loss. And sure, that leads to like peace down the road. So you could say that's an outcome. But sitting with grief, I think sometimes is not always a bad thing. What do you think? I agree. Grieving is part of the healing process. Okay. How are you feeling right now, by the way? A little more comfortable than when I started. Okay. <laughs> or do you feel like we're walking on shaky ice? No. Um, I'm struggling for the words to try to articulate our son's behavior uh, and, and answering your question on how we de-escalate. And it's, it's kind of one of those things, it's a little difficult to describe, but um, it's, it's a tactic or technique in trying to de-escalate. And it's a little difficult to describe. And, it's, and it depends on the situation at hand because his meltdowns quite often aren't consistent. They're, they're different things that would uh, bring on a meltdown. Sometimes they're unpredictable. Sometimes we can predict them. Okay. Um, okay. That, that makes sense because it, it sounds like, you know, you're doing a lot of stuff up here. You're making a lot of calculations and that's like a pretty complex equation. And then like words come out of your mouth, but it's hard to really explain to us how that process works. Right. That makes a lot of sense. I mean, I can imagine it would be hard to, to explain. 
and um, it, you know, to amplify on that, that our, our friends and family who see him occasionally think he's the sweetest kid, but they don't know what he's like at home. So how does that feel for them to see him as the sweetest kid, but not know what he's like at home? It's, it's difficult because they, they don't understand how he could behave and have meltdowns like we described. And until they witness it themselves. What's difficult and, about that? Some people don't believe us. <laughs> so what is it like to be not believed by some people? What is it like to have them not understand? Um, it, it is, it's difficult to relate. Okay. So I think, Dave, that there's an emotion there. Difficult to relate is what we see on the outside, right? That's a result. Like it's hard for these two people to relate. How do you, do you have a sense of if there's like an emotion that you feel when other people don't understand what you're saying? No, it's just, um, it's just one of those things you can try to articulate it and, ex and describe what a meltdown is, what causes it. But until they, they witness it firsthand, I don't think they, they have a full understanding of it. Right. So what's it like for you to talk to someone who doesn't have a full understanding and sort of like thinks that he's just this happy go lucky kid. It, it, it's, um, it, it doesn't bother me or it isn't, um, uh, in, in difficult at all. It's just, you try to articulate it and if they don't understand or comprehend it, that's okay. It, it doesn't, affect me at all sure but they don't know what our life is really like at home so what do you think it's like for a human being to interact with other human beings who don't know what their life is like uh misunderstanding sure. don't understand uh what makes them tick so or, i'm going to uh, toss out a word which is what i'm digging for okay but I think that this is a vocabulary that, that you may be unfamiliar with. We're playing with a system that you may be kind of unfamiliar with. So when I, when I hear that, what I imagine you may be feeling on some level is actually kind of like isolated. When I think about human connection, I think about people who can relate to each other. And relationships are based on like shared experiences. And when I think about someone who doesn't share, like who has an experience of child rearing and, and has a son that other people haven't seen what that son is like, I can imagine that it's difficult for y'all to have a shared experience of what it's like, what, what Carson is like. And when I think about a lack of shared experience, then I think about isolation because shared experience is what connects us. What do you think? Yeah, I see what you're saying. Um, I guess to expand on that is you're right. Uh, we, we don't have a common experience with other family friends mm -hmm. in, in that relationship of a child uh, with special needs. Um, but yet on the other hand, those family friends that we do have, we do have a lot of other things in common. Sure. And uh, socialize together. Of course, have, uh, weekend ski trips together, for example, in which Carson participates. But on that one um, realm of special needs here or a child behavior, they can't fully relate to it. And how do you feel if they do understand? If they see it? It's a, it's a good feeling that there is a common understanding and they can appreciate what we go through. Yeah. What is that feeling? Well, it's satisfying, comforting. Yeah. I, I see you smiling a little bit. Yeah. 
do you know what you're feeling right now? Like, as we started talking about it, I, I noticed that that feeling almost came up for you. Yeah, it's just, it's trying to get to uh, describing where, where you're leading me to, trying to help find the words to describe it. Yeah. What, so what, what are you feeling? Do you know? It's the understanding and the relationship between people. Yeah. So can I, can I toss out a word? Sure. Connected. Right. You feel connected? And right. how, how does it feel? Like, cause like that feels good, right? So, so what, I, what I'm hearing from you, it, it's strange, right? Because you would think for a moment, let's be non-judgmental, Okay, Dave. So sure. you would think for a moment that your family friends seeing one of Carson's meltdowns would be like a bad thing. On paper, it looks like a bad thing. And in a sense, it is a bad thing. But I think there's something really important here, which is that I get the sense that you and your family are sort of like fighting this like very isolated war. And every day is a struggle. And, and Carson's fighting with you guys, too. Like, I don't think he's the enemy. I think he's on your team. And what you guys are fighting against is Carson's autism and COVID. And, and I think your brother, I mean, your son put it beautifully that he kind of thinks about Carson as a normal person who's trapped in an autistic mind. What do you think about that? Oh, I agree. And... And sometimes it can feel very, very tiring and exhausting and stressful to fight what I imagine may sometimes feel like you to be an endless battle. Like, do you think this is a battle that you got a war that you guys win? No, no I, I don't look at it in that realm. It is something we have to learn about him because we can't fix him yep we have to understand him and connect with him and the way his mind processes and how he deals with his frustrations and challenges and communications with us okay. and it's, it's a daily a daily challenge and a daily lesson learned and um it's it's trying, but that's the way my wife and I are is we face challenges and we I see that face it on and keep keep chugging away day at a time. Yeah, you know, he uh Zach mentioned something else to me was that which is that Carson um when he was first diagnosed with autism, you guys had been sort of given the diagnosis that he's gonna be nonverbal. Right. And that he's apparently overly verbal now. Which I, yeah. which, which I think is actually like a huge testament to the attitude that you and your wife take, which is that, you know, you face challenges head on. And, and I, I'm telling you, I've seen nonverbally diagnosed autistic people who end up nonverbal. And I've also seen families who do heroic things and, and defy all the odds. And I've also seen families who do heroic things and the odds don't get defied. We've been fortunate and I do give credit to my wife because she in, has endured it more than me because I've been at work, you know, eight, 10 hours a day and she's been home uh, raising him. Um, but um, we have treated him like a normal kid with no disability and inclusion is very important. And I think because of that, we've, we've had the successes we've had. Yeah. How do you feel talking about this stuff? It's, it's great to talk about. It. It's a great feeling. You know, the, um, even though we have the daily challenges, we have to reflect back on the progress that we've made and how far he's come. And that, for example, like you mentioned, he's nonverbal and he's using sign language. We, we taught sign language to him when he was three years old. And uh, wow. Here he is now, fully verbal. He's graduated from high school, and um, we've made great progress. He plays the piano. He's an awesome skier. He's on. We we're a coach in Special Olympics, and so he's made great progress physically, emotionally, and intellectually as well. But a, 
a lot of credit goes to my wife because she helped him get through high school by tutoring at home and building study sheets for him on the various subject matters that he was taking in high school. And uh, it, it's been a team effort, a lot of investment, and we're reaping some of those rewards, but we still have a long ways to go though. Sure. Independence, independence is where we're, we're striving for that he can live on his own and hold uh, hold down a job and um, be able to interact socially. Yeah. We got a ways to go, but that's, that's come at a sacrifice too with, uh, I think with, what have you with sacrificed? Zach, uh, I think with Zach, it's, it's sacrificed time with him because of the interruptions and disturbances uh, due to Carson's behavior and, and uh, the challenges with him. And certainly other sacrifices, you know, in the family as well. But um, you know, we're dealt our deck of cards, and we play our hand. And uh, like I said we look back and look at the great progress he's made. But it's been a lot of work getting there. Not complaining. Would it be okay if you did? I think it'd be selfish. You know, um, this is our family. What's and, selfish uh, about complaining? Well, complaining that my life, or pity on me because of my family life with an autistic son. But uh, there's other great rewards that others don't don't experience. And that's seeing a child that's disabled grow and become mature and striving towards independence and seeing the progress. There's great rewards and satisfaction in that. Okay. So, Dave, I'm going to toss something out for you to think about, okay? I understand where you're coming from in terms of not complaining and, you know, not throwing yourself a pity party. And at the same time, I think we're running up against some lost value. And there's a difference between accepting that you have some negative emotion and throwing yourself a pity party. Because as bizarre as this sounds, I think that you are entitled if you feel like it, to complain. What do you think about that? I can understand that. And I'll be honest, my wife and I have complained to each other. Good. And it's good and healthy to talk about that. And um, myself, I'm more independent prefer to do my own problem solving and resolve things myself mm -hmm. and not have to rely on others. Where and did you wife, learn that? Good question. I don't know if it, I think it's just I'm wired that way. How do but people get wired? DNA, genetics, <laughs> probably from my parents. Can you tell us but, my wife and I, again, we're kind of wired in the same fashion is we hunker down and, and get her done. And uh, yeah, we can um, talk about it ourselves, console each other. And, and if you want to say complain, but yet we look back and we see uh, how grateful we are and the gratitude and how rewarding it's been working with our son, but yet it's been very difficult at the same time. Yeah. I think that complain is a tricky word because it implies, I, I can't imagine complaining and gratitude coexisting, but the way that you're kind of talking about it, I, I do think that there's been sorrow and joy, triumph and failure. You know, when I really hear about it, I, I think that there's been negative and positive. Um, and I, I do, I would encourage you to, you know, I'm actually happy that you, you complain to your wife. I think that's healthy for you. I think it's healthy to acknowledge that things are hard for us sometimes and it doesn't make us weak. What do you think? Yeah, I agree. It, it's healthy. It's a, it's, it's a con, consoling, it's therapeutic. And even uh, talking with friends, we, we've, we've talked with friends before too, that did do understand Carson and. And they sympathize with us, encourage us. And then they're also um, very, very encouraging as well. So, 
Can you tell us a little bit about your upbringing? Sure. I uh, grew up in Southern California, was uh, involved in high school sports and in band. Uh, went to college in Southern California, and then I uh, was on a ROTC scholarship. Wow. And so graduating from college, then I went uh, right into the Air Force, was commissioned, went in the Air Force. I had a variety of space operations jobs and system acquisition for space systems. And then uh, spent 27 years in the Air Force, retired 13 years ago, been working for a defense contractor ever since. Uh, married my wife when I was uh, a little more senior, I was 36, year old, 36 years old, and um, she had uh, one son from a prior marriage, and then we had Zach and Carson, and we've been married 27 years. Wow. So uh, <laughs> can I ask you a couple of questions? They may be a little bit personal. You're allowed to not answer them. Sure. Uh, I, I, I appreciate the hesitation with your answer there. But so let me ask you something like, um, you know, what about her? What like so I, I think about a 36 year old guy who's unmarried. And so I, I sometimes think that it takes a special kind of woman to, you know, get you to settle down. Can you tell us a little bit about what your experience with meeting your wife was like and, and how you guys decided to get married? Sure. Um, you're right. She's a special woman. I married up. <laughs> and uh we had i think a lot in common in uh the career field we were in i was in the air force she was a civilian uh defense contract or excuse me a defense employee uh we had the same ambitions for his family uh same likes and dislikes in the way of hobbies and sports and we kind of had the same drive too. I think we're kind of wired similar as, as I mentioned before, we, we face challenges head on and we like working challenges and, uh, and be, being fulfilled with success and the outcome of, uh, of challenges. And uh, we had a, just a lot in common and uh, we can communicate, we could talk. And she was, she's, was my best friend then and she still is. You say you're wired similarly. Um, you mean like in what way? What about y'all is similar in terms of your wiring? Our drive. Um, follow through to completion. Mm -hmm. I'll say service. Serving others so that they are satisfied, which is sometimes challenging, obviously, but um, concerned about always meeting the needs of others in our, in our careers, even what she does now, she's a interior designer and, uh, always, uh, wanting to satisfy the customer, okay. the client. Sounds like she really puts other people ahead of herself. Yes, definitely. You sound like you value her a lot. And oh Yeah. Yeah, like I said, she's, she's my best friend, so I, I can lean on her with anything. Mm -hmm. Does she lean on you? Yes. In what ways? Um, emotionally, and she can come talk to me. Uh, physically, she's out helping me with projects, working on the house. Um, essentially, any other project, we do things together, and uh, we're a good team. Mm-hmm. And uh, she has talents like in uh, communication. She's better at communicating than I am. You know, I'm, I'm an engineer. Uh, engineers typically don't know how to communicate very well. And I'm a good example of that. And she's uh, uh, very complimentary in that realm. When If I have to write something or have to uh, articulate something, she's very good at helping in crafting the right choices of words. I you know, oddly enough, Dave, I, I don't know that I would agree with you that engineers are not good at communicating, nor would I call you a not good communicator. Um, can I tell you what I see? Sure. 
I don't see a problem with communication. I see a lack of vocabulary. Fair. Fair assessment. I, I, I don't think it's an issue of talent. I think it's an issue of experience. You know, I, I think you're. I think if we gave you the words, you'd be able to use them very, very well. I think you're just somewhat unfamiliar with the words because I think you're somewhat unfamiliar with your internal environment, which is a little bit judgmental to say, but I'm just, you know, you've been very authentic with me and I, I hope it's okay that I be transparent with you. And I'll explain what I mean by that. What do you think about that? You're right. Uh, English and communication has not been my strong suit, nor a uh, big interest when it came to academics or school. Mm -hmm. And it has been uh, one of the weaker uh, talents of mine or skill sets. Uh, I preferred more of the math, technical side. Sure. That's, where, that's what I enjoy. Uh, never have been one that really enjoys writing novels or sure. stories or, or anything like that. And so my wife is a little more talented in that, that realm. And then, so we balance each other out. Yeah. So, so if I can offer something kind of relating to that. So I think it's interesting because understanding the self in the West has become related to like poetry, right? It's like understanding the self and understanding emotions is like therapy and poetry. And it's all these like nebulous, like not really based in any real system kind of things. Does that make sense? I mean, I, I, yeah. I say this as a psychiatrist, like I've just noticed this. So there's an interesting study that was done that if you look at couples counseling, men actually are reluctant to engage in couples counseling because they feel disadvantaged because it's a territory that they don't know how to play that game. What do you think about that? I don't know. I hadn't thought of that before. Yeah, it's kind didn't of interesting. Know, didn't know of a study like that. Yeah. It, would you feel uncomfortable doing something like family counseling or couples counseling? No. Why not? Because there's value in it in making the family life better. Okay. So I completely agree that you would be willing to do it and that you would be gung-ho. What I'm asking you is, would you feel uncomfortable? Sure. Right? So like, this is, I think, something, Dave, that I would really encourage you to tunnel down. And because and, I noticed that you can feel a particular way and you're very good at actually mastering your feelings. But just because you can control your discomfort or compensate for it doesn't mean that the discomfort isn't there. Does that make sense? Yeah. Do you think there's value in understanding that the discomfort is there and where it comes from? Yes. Why? In order to, you have to understand the root of that discomfort before you can do any sort of correction. Okay. So can we play with live ammo? With that principle, can I ask you a question that maybe a little bit evokes some emotion? Sure. Are you feeling uncomfortable already? As I tee it up, just wonder what the question's going to be. Yeah. I know, right? So, so let so we're already playing with live ammo. That was the question. That was it. There's another one, but so yeah. like when I ask that question now, how do you feel? Close your eyes. What do you feel in your body? Now that I put you on the spot. A little discomfort. Where? Um, well, you're, you're getting personal when yep. there's viewers online here. Yep. Versus, so when someone different. engages you personally, what do you feel? Protective. And what are you protecting? Uh, I guess weaknesses. Okay. And which weaknesses are you protecting? Particular ones? I think it's that I tend to be more private. Mm -hmm. and so now I'm opening the door and revealing more so of who I am mm -hmm. in, inside 
versus what is the appearance on the outside. Okay. So we can talk about, that's a, a topic I think for a different day about, you know, thinking about, I would encourage you to think about, you know, is it okay for other people to see what's on the inside? Because I imagine that you were taught that the answer to that question is no. I think you have your own independent answers. But I would hypothesize that you were conditioned to not show people. And I would also hypothesize that that has something to do with the way that your parents were. What do you think about that? I think it's a little both. Uh, my, my parents, I think, were um, between the, themselves were, were open. Outside of the household, I'll say not so much. They're more private. Um, myself, some of that, some of myself is, is uh, acquired from my upbringing. Mm -hmm. And some of it is by, on personal experience in that if I have uh, opened up, um, I've been burned. Hmm. So again, going back to protection hmm. and, um, it's, it's a protection, I guess, on how much you reveal or what you reveal. Okay. Okay. And I'll say there's value in doing that personally for me, being able to trust someone and to communicate, uh, what's, what's going on inside, but then also I think there's value if somebody can benefit from that or benefit from my experience, uh, maybe however private it might be, there's value in that to help someone else out. Sure. So, um, Dave, I, I want to maybe ask you just a couple more questions and then we can get you and Zach on, on together. Is that okay? Sure. So, um, you mentioned earlier, uh, and I, I noticed a little bit of negative emotion around this, that, that you know, you've, you guys have come really a long way with Carson, but that sometimes at the cost of Zach, you use the word sacrifice. Can you help me understand that a little bit better? When Carson would have his meltdowns when he was young and e even now, um, obviously it's a major distraction and an inter interruption. Mm -hmm. And especially if there's already some sort of interaction with Zach and there's a rhythm going and out of the blue, you get an interruption from Carson. It unfortunately takes time away from Zach. And I think that has been the case at, with him growing up, that Carson has always been distracted and uh, interfered with the relationship development with Zach. How do you it's feel just my, about that? My observation. How do you feel about that? Um, it's lost time. It's lost time that can never get back. And those, uh, those younger years that I, I think of from four to 10, somewhere in there where they start to become independent start to develop their own character and who they're going to be. Those are precious years. They go so stinking fast. Mm -hmm. And can't get back the lost time. And uh, it hurts. What hurts about it? That I think that could have Uh, jeopardize the relationship that we maybe have today. And um, if he was in need for any kind of emotional support, he couldn't get it because there's a distraction going on with Carson. Mm -hmm. And um, there is some guilt there. 
and you know missed out on that opportunity to really bond in those early years like that because they're, they're precious moments and you realize that obviously as you get older and you look back uh, those are just precious years that you and you can't get those any other way only only with a a parent child relationship like that you can't get that kind of uh, fulfillment any other way and are you talking about fulfillment for you or fulfillment for Zach both have you guys ever talked about this very lightly that I recall once okay and um I, I think it's possible that either of us really didn't know how to introduce it or how to even start that discussion. Um, thank you for sharing that. I can see that it was emotional for you. It was emotional for me too. Um, how do you feel about, you know, do you feel okay right now? Can we keep talking? Sure. I'm good. Um, so how's your relationship with Zach now? Sounds like a good idea. I think I'm going to hydrate too. Yeah. Um, non, non-combative, not confrontational. And pretty much we only see each other since COVID that I've been working at home. Might see him in the morning in the kitchen when I take a break and then see him at dinner. And we converse and talk pretty much whatever's going on in the news and it's very brief and that's it. And most of his time is in the basement, uh, in his room, uh, assuming, uh, gaming. Mm -hmm. Um, and that's really the extent of it. Okay. How do you feel about that? Again, it goes back to the relationship. Uh, I don't think that's healthy. We're both missing out on time. Time is ticking away and it's a valuable opportunity that we're all in the same household and he's back from school that we could attempt to bond, um, establish a friendship and help even as a him part of the team helping with Carson as well. Do you feel like he doesn't help with Carson? He's attempted, he's tried. I think um, it's, a, it's a bit difficult for him, I think, uh, emotionally. I think also he may not fully have the tool set, the skill set of how to work with Carson because he has been away at school essentially for five years. Sure. And, uh, it's a long time. Yeah. And the only time you saw him was when he came home at, you know, holidays and stuff like that. And so it's very brief and he may not fully understand how Carson works or how he ticks now. And, um, how do you, how do you help him? And I think one way is try to become a friend with Carson. Try to understand uh, what's going on in his mind, what his frustrations are. Sure. So, Dave, I'm gonna we're gonna get Zach back in here in a minute because um, we've been talking for a little while, and I think this kind of stuff can be kind of energy intensive. And I don't know that you've got a whole lot of excess fuel to burn. Well, I'm good. I'm <laughs> um, good. Okay. Uh, but my, you know, is it okay if I share a couple of thoughts with you? Sure. So first thing is that I I don't think that like this is about Carson yet. So I I know that Carson is a huge part of y'all's life and, and, you know, dominates a lot of what y'all spend your time working on, thinking on, enjoying. Um, and my first thought is that 
that at least between you and Zach, the first thing that needs to happen is that like y'all need to form a relationship independent of anyone else in your family. Right. Like, like if I had to sum it up, you have to make up for lost time. Right. And so what do you think about that? Fully agree. Um, it's, it's a little difficult right now because, um, we're not communicating to understand where he is right now after returning from school. Mm -hmm. Um, Obviously, he's funding relief through gaming. Mm -hmm. um, there's, you know, there's certainly everybody has their own way of dealing with stress and, and relief. Some, you know, maybe physical exercise or whatever, but uh, that tends to be his relief. And um, I think we we just want to make sure that we don't push him too hard because we we don't fully understand what he's going through okay. emotionally and, and mentally and uh so it's kind of kid gloves and trying to understand would like to understand the emotions what he's going through and what he is thinking about for the way ahead okay so Dave, a couple of thoughts. The first thing is, you know, I want to respect your privacy, especially as you've gotten burned before. So we have an option, a couple of options. One is that, you know, we can just get Zach back in here. and We can sort of kind of sum up. It'll be kind of kid gloves. I'll share a couple of general thoughts and then leave the two of you to start that discussion or whatever kind of on your own in private. Okay. Um, upsides of that, it's safe. Downsides of that, you may quickly fall into a pattern where it's hard to get over that activation energy of having those kinds of conversations. Option two is that we can think about starting that conversation like now. Um, and pro problems with that is that sometimes it could get emotional. It could feel voyeuristic because people are watch watching and I don't want to pressure you into, you know, anything that you don't feel comfortable with. Upside is that I think that you've, you've said a couple of things to me today that while they're hot and fresh in your mind would be very valuable for Zach to hear. So I leave it up to you. We're going to go, you want to have the conversation with him now, or do you want to just have a general kind of sum up? I would like to get his input. But uh, I think option one, the general sum up, and then he and I embark on a private conversation. Okay. Can I share with you one or two things that I think it's important for you to say to him? Sure. Um, at the top of the list is I think like you shared about lost time. I think that's something that Zach needs to hear from you. Okay. Um, does that make sense to you? Yes. What makes sense about that? He understands where I'm coming from and, and sort of the reason to, to try to reestablish that relationship. I think it's even more, it's run simpler than that. I think he needs to understand that the fact that y'all lost time hurts you. What do you think about that? Yes, he, he needs to understand that. I and, agree. And, and I think this is the tricky thing, right? Is like, I don't think anyone would say that you did anything wrong. And that's important for you to understand. And that's important for him to understand. And yet this kind of goes back to like, what is the value of negativity if it leads to like, you know, it, it's just, I, I think he needs to see that you recognize that y'all were dealt a bad hand because eight-year-old Zach, nine-year-old Zach and 10-year-old Zach didn't, couldn't understand that. But now he's a grown, he's a grown man. And I think that he also feels the lack of y'all's relationship. And I think the, the, the way to really start bridging that gap is like to talk about what, it, you know, what, what it was like.
And and I, I, I don't know, and here's the other last thing that I'll tell you, Dave, is that I think you uh, do an excellent job of trying to understand everything outside of yourself. So even when you talk about Zach and you think about your interactions with him, you say, I need to understand him better. The other thing that I would encourage you to do is let other people understand you. You don't always have to be the understander. And let Zach, let him see who you are. Because it, I, it seems to me like you've raised two amazing sons. And you can start to lean on them too. I know it sounds weird. But, you know, I, I think the conversation isn't just about understanding him. In a weird way, like you almost have to model opening up. Because he's more likely to open up if you open up. Yeah, what somebody's got to make the first move, yep. sort of. And I, I don't, I don't know. And it, here's why I think I don't know that it should be you, but the reason that I am defaulting to you making the first move is because, out of all of the conversations I've had with him and you. You're the one who I think has said the words that are the most important to say. And that's why I think you should say them. It's not about first. It's just you have the most important thing to say. Yeah. Thoughts? Questions? So the, the first one you mentioned was lost time. Was there a second? Nope. That I missed? Okay. I mean, I think that's that's a great place to start, right? And, and thinking about y'all's relationship and, and what that kind of looks like and feels like to you guys now. I think the second point for you is that I think understanding what you're feeling and also communicating that to Zach could be healthy for both of you. And I think we'll pave the way for him to do the same. Third thing okay. is, anyway, the rest we can talk about together. You feel okay grabbing him? Yeah. Okay. We'll go get him. Yep, I know everybody wants them to talk on stream, but that's for us, right? That's not for them. So I don't doubt that that would get clipped and shipped, but that's not what we're here for. Oh, all right, I'm right over here. <laughs> All right, can we get both the oh, perfect? Okay. So, Zach, yes. I talked to your dad for a little bit longer than I talked to you. Did you? I think so. Not sure. I, don't, I was um, <laughs> um what were you concerned at all about what we were talking about or were you thinking about it at all? Well, I was talking to my mom about it, but we ended up getting sidetracked from other discussions. Okay. Um, Zach, do you want to summarize uh, kind of our conversation for your dad? And then we'll have your dad kind of summarize what we talked about. How does that sound to start? Sure. So go for it. Oh, I thought you said you. Okay. Nope. <laughs> I'm going to have you uh, do it. So let me think here. Um, uh, we could, we're kind of all over the place, aren't we? We started by talking about the a conversation that I had with mom earlier. What was this? Was like a half a week ago, um, which was about uh, like the situation with Carson mm. um, and his autism and how that's sort of affecting us as a family. Um, stuff like a lot of time was spent on the situation with the window cleaners, and so like how she conveyed to me her perspective of that situation and what my perspective of that situation was as well. And how like there was a whole bunch of crazy stuff going on, you know, and how Carson was obviously difficult and whatnot, but then also how you play into that and how mom plays into that and how um, everyone just sort of like beats on each other. Right. <laughs> like Carson will have his pattern and then, um, you will have your set rules or whatever that you have to follow. And the mom will try to enforce those, but then Carson will fight to get back against that. 
and then other people fight each other and then i'm just trying to like sit on the sidelines and not get involved and like hype myself right <laughs> because i don't want to be part of any of that um what else did we talk about i don't remember I, I can i can kind of jump in um okay. thanks thanks for sharing that zach so a couple of other things uh Dave, that we talked about, or a little bit about y'all's interpersonal interactions. And um, Zach has the impression that you're quite organized and quite structured. And um, I had actually hypothesized to Zach that maybe if you feel uncomfortable or anxious or stressed, that the way that you the way that you manage that stress is by import imposing order around you, because that may help you, you know, like. The more chaotic things become, the more you kind of double down on imposing order and structure. Um, we uh, also talked a little bit about y'all's relationship, and and Zach mentioned to me uh, uh, that you know he feels a little bit closer to your wife, and that they're able to talk a little bit more freely, um, and that he does want to be able to kind of talk to you maybe so somewhat in the same way. I mean, I think he acknowledges that y'all are different and that you don't have to have the same relationship. Um, but that communicating and better understanding between the two of you is actually really important. We spent a fair amount of time talking about Carson, um, you know, y'all's family situation, uh, the challenges that y'all face, um, and, and kind of gave me a lot of background, shared a couple of stories, but I think that basically... Oh, the other thing, interesting thing that he said is that he actually knows very little about like what your life growing up was like. And, and he actually doesn't know too much about you. Um, and maybe he was a little bit curious about that. Sometimes uh, it, it, it seems like um, either he or your wife may feel like they, they're kind of walking on eggshells around you, that they're afraid that they may upset you if they say or do the wrong thing. Um, and I'm, I'm just sharing this stuff with you not to kind of put you on the spot or try to get you to defend yourself or anything like that. I don't think it's like either or. I don't think someone is right or someone is wrong. I'm just sharing with you what their what his perception is and how he feels. Any thoughts, questions, responses? No, oh, I understand. Uh, I've heard those comments before. And... Um... I do remember Zach one time expressing that he didn't know much about me or my childhood. Mm -hmm. that, that's fair. Um, yet, on the other hand, for example, I think the time that it actually occurred was we were sitting around a campfire. And that would have been an opportune time to ask questions, sure. try to understand what was your childhood like mm -hmm. what did i do growing up and mm -hmm. the, the the fun times the challenging times and experiences sure sure so uh it's a little bit of both i didn't divulge to him nor did he inquire sure so what i'm hearing from you is that it's a two-way street yes Absolutely. That's fair. Right. Sure. Um, uh, Dave, do you want to sum up uh, or, or kind of share what we talked about with Zach? Yeah, it seemed to pretty quickly head down to uh, Carson in, in the center of the discussion, pretty much. Center of the family. <clears throat> and uh, family dynamics and uh, his... Uh, it, impact on the family and uh how that i think impacted our relationship when you were younger somewhere around that four to ten year period where uh, to me those are very precious years as you start to develop your character and, and your identity and who you're going to be and uh those are very precious years in my view of um, establishing a relationship and bonding and uh, I sensed that Carson was a distraction during that time where we could not 
establish that relationship and do things together, do the, the boy stuff, the manly stuff. And uh, as a result, that's, uh, I think, contributed to sort of the relationship we have today where it's not as close as it should be. I saw you reacting. Dave, I thought that was going to be a private conversation. Oh, the details. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So if, if that's option two, if we've already opened the door, if you want to continue. I mean, I didn't open any doors, bro. <laughs> <laughs> I was okay. Oh, you got yeah. Yep. No, I didn't cut off. I just stopped talking. Oh, okay. <laughs> I just couldn't. Okay. So now I'm a little bit confused because I don't know what to do. Um, so, okay. I guess we're talking about it now. So Zach, um, what did you hear from your dad? I'm already blanked. <laughs> okay. So think for a second. What 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 did he say? Sorry for derailing both y'all. I was caught off yeah. guard. Yeah, no, I'm caught off guard. Um, so like, first of all, two way street. I remember that. Mm -hmm. And then he said that you guys started talking about cars. Oh yeah, how like the the early years are important or whatever for like developing your identity and stuff, which is actually something that I kind of disagree with. I think that even still now I'm kind of struggling with my identity and whatnot. And that's something mm -hmm. that you go through your whole life, but that's a different conversation. Um, yeah. I, the, Carson, I don't know if he was necessarily a distraction per se. Um, I just think that as a family, we struggled to handle him. We didn't know what we were doing. No, there was no guidebook, how to have an autistic child in your family and not screw up family relationships because of it. Right. It's going to cause strains and it's hard to know how to handle that. And so I think that it wasn't, it was, it was just really hard for us all to handle that. We were all spending so much time on him that we couldn't spend time on each other because we didn't know what we were doing. Yep. Um, and then, like, I now remember when I was talking to you how I was saying that it was difficult for me to connect with Carson because, I mean, again, I didn't know what I was doing. Um, I felt like I was just, in general, being an asshole to him because so, that was So, Zach, I'm going to just interrupt you. And yeah. I apologize. So, Dave, so I think Zach... What did you hear? How would you describe what Zach heard? Um, maybe missed the mark that it was lost time. Yep. And he didn't miss the mark. I think you guys did what y'all do, which is you guys talk about situations, right? So he understood that you were saying that like, you know, there's character development because you don't say you leave out y'all y'all eat brisket. Oh yeah. What, so like what? you know you know when you slice into brisket and that juice is in the middle, and it's like when you get a well cooked brisket and it falls apart, but it's like moist and juicy. Yeah. You left out the juice, Dave. Right? You you gave him the structure. But what you said just now is very different from what you conveyed to me. Does that make sense to you? The words are the same. I, I guess I misunderstand. Okay, sorry. So like you talked about lost time, but when we were talking about it, what were you feeling when you and I talked about it? Oh, it was emotional. Yep. And when you were talk telling it to Zach, what were you feeling? It was emotional and not to the extent when I was talking to you. Yep. Right. So like Zach, did you get any emotion from him when he said that? Uh, a little bit at the start, but that was about it. Yep. And I think this is what, what y'all do, which is normal, by the way, is that like, you know, you're conveying the words, but I, I think... Um, if, if you're okay, Dave, I'm going to push you. Is that okay? Because, I mean, you open the door, but we can just stop. Sure. So how do you feel? So first of all, let's be explicit. Like, what do you, what does lost time mean to you in relation to Zach? 
those are years of childhood that um, are valuable, as I mentioned, and you can never get them back. And those years, those those precious years of four to ten, roughly, when when you're a, a child like that, and everything's happy go lucky, um, no no worries in the world, uh, no stresses, or your mind is not polluted yet from the, the environment. Uh, those years of dad and child development can never get get those back again okay so you talk about dad and child so what i'm hearing you say is that there are times of zach's life that because of carson's needs you were not able to give him what you really wanted to yes is that fair now, to say? yeah and, and i'll also add in there too that it isn't a blame or all on carson I was still pursuing a career at the same time Mm -hmm. and very demanding. And so again, trying to stay balanced personally and with the family was extremely challenging. And, uh, Carson was a heavy weight on that scale. And who paid the price of that weight? We all did, (laughs) but, uh, Certainly, Zach, I think, paid a price. Okay. Zach, what's it like to hear that? Uh, I don't know. It's it's so weird because, like, I can't remember that much of that period of my life, right? And I've been spending so much of my time recently speaking, thinking about, like, recent times and trying to, like, help myself right now with the future and whatnot. Um. So it's like, it's hard to wrap my head around the perspective on this one. Yeah, I don't know. I don't really, yeah, I don't really know what I'm feeling. I want this one. <laughs> so I'm going to try to translate for Dave. Okay, Dave, is that okay? I'm sure. going to take the spotlight off of you. Is that cool? Sure. So Zach, I I think what I understood, and this is the advantage of streaming this to the internet, is now you can go back and watch it. Um, but I think what I heard from your dad, uh, and what I felt very palpably is that like, like we have to be careful because it's not about blame, but what I really felt from him was that he actually mourns the lack of time that he's been, he, he mourns the amount of time that he hasn't been able to give you. Mm -hmm. And we're not saying that he acted wrongly. We're not saying that he's to blame. We're not saying that Carson's to blame. It's just the reality of y'all's household. And that's what's tough, right? No one's to blame. And yet he really wishes that he could have had, and I know you don't remember those years, but I have, a, I have an almost five-year-old. So I kind of know a little bit about what Dave's talking about. And, and there is something incredibly precious and valuable about bonding and forming a relationship. And that time just doesn't come back. And, um, what I, I think what really may, maybe what Dave is trying to say is, that, you know, just that, that, that he feels hurt by not being able to give you, in a sense, what he feels like you deserve. How's that, Dave? Good summary. Hard for Dave to say. How does it make you feel to hear that from me? <laughs> can, can you try tell, it'd probably be better if you actually, do you feel comfortable saying Something like that directly to Zach. Oh yeah, sure. I feel comfortable doing that. Can y'all look at each other? Because it's fucking. I feel. Yeah. I don't know what. It's fucking weird. Yeah, Apologies it, for the language. When I was interested in having the family, I was really interested in bonding with the young, innocent child and growing up with that child. And doing cool stuff together. 
and we we did have some moments where we've been camping and fishing and skied like crazy but there were always distractions distractions of carson is one and certainly a distraction to the stress of my my job and the, what i was pursuing in a career and um it was a distraction to me mentally and, and um it didn't allow us to, I think, to fully develop a relationship when you're younger that could continue on in your adult life. And particularly now, when you, like you mentioned, trying to understand your identity now, that I could be there along with your mom and uh, help you through the, the trial you're going through now. Um, it's, you can't explain it. You can only experience it. But being a parent, it's a real tough balancing act when you're trying to be a provider emotionally, financially, um, and to provide for your family, pursue a career, have time to spend with your wife and spend time with your kids, and yet have some alone time to do your things you like to do if you want to go to the gym or go run or whatever, but try to balance all these demands in life. And then you have a special needs child thrown into the equation, makes it even more difficult. There's no manual, there's no training uh, to help young parents manage a family like that. And, uh, that's one thing I think lack, lacking in our society and our school system is how do you have a functional family? How do you teach kids to raise kids, become parents, and how to balance their life and to be um, successful at the parent, parenting? We don't teach that in school and there's no manual that comes with each kid because every kid is unique, wired completely different. And um, we learn by the seat of our pants or by our parents or by our, our friends. Zach, what was that like to listen to? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> it was emotional at parts, right? Yeah. Um, so your dad did something where he went underwater, felt those emotions, and then suddenly now we're talking about how people need a manual for child raise, rearing. Yeah. And so, Dave, I think your mind does something where when you feel emotions, the engineering brain turns on and you start talking about abstract problem-solving kinds of things because it's hard for you to just hit the pause button when you're conveying to Zach how you feel which is okay, right? So that's a well, skill that you'll need to learn. It, it may be sort of an excuse is in that um, I did the best I could. Yep. There's no annual to tell me, you know, how to raise him or how to in, spend time with and enjoy yep. him. And so uh, it's just trying to articulate that every kid is unique and how you raise them or how you establish relationships is they're all different. Okay. Yeah. yeah. I, I think it's everything you said is spot on, man. Um, Zach, you look like you're kind of processing anything that you want to share with your dad. I mean, you don't have to share anything, by the way. Mm. And Dave, you were supposed to have this conversation in private, but I'm sort of glad you had it in public because I don't, I don't know if you, it would have come across the right way. Okay. You don't have to say anything if you want to just process. I mean, the only thought that's coming to mind is that, like, yeah, it. you generally do not get emotional about things. <laughs> and a lot of, like... That's an observation, not a blame, Dave. Yeah. yeah. A, a lot of communication becomes easier when you're able to convey those things. Like, when I was able to connect with mom really well, when she was able to explain how she felt to me. 
And I think that part of why I've been able to get close to her is more so is because of that, right? Like our relationship has always been about, I don't know how to explain it, but like things, right? Like it's, it's been, we're going to go skiing or we're going to go ride ATVs or we're going to work on this thing together or teaching. It's been so much more like, I guess literal. I don't know how to explain her. There's words for that, but yeah, I understand that emotional connection has never really been there. Um, and yeah, it, I, I don't mean yeah. I'm just sort of like spilling thoughts, right? I'm not like <laughs> going so anywhere with it. I'm gonna jump in. So Dave, I think you've got to be careful because you can feel blame when he says something like that. Do you feel blame? It, I'll say yes, but I, I understand where he's coming from. Yep. It's true. So, so this, once again, and is about you can feel blame, but not be at fault. Yeah. Right? That's that's a big lesson here, is that what you feel on the inside... So, so here's what I'm going to say to y'all, okay? And now we're going to kind of wrap up, if that's okay with you guys. Any questions? So, okay. So the first thing is that um, Zach... So, Dave, when you think about those formative years of four to ten, I think you lucked out. Because what Zach is telling you is that his formative years aren't over yet, and he still needs your help. So I think, sure, you missed four to ten, but he's as old as he is now, and he's asking for you to help him figure that out. And he's saying that, you know, it's not too late. And that it's important that even if you guys have had trouble, you guys have always focused on things, that like now is your chance. Um, is that fair, Zach? Yeah, I'd say that's fair. The last thing that I'll just say is COVID is a... F Can I... Are y'all okay with bad language? I am. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, so then I'll, I'll avoid it. Sorry. Um, you know, I'm... I grew up in a culture of moral decay, Dave. So my, my <laughs> language is loose. Uh, but but COVID is a mess. And, and it really puts a lot of pressures on, on families. And I, I really hope that, um, you know, I think family counseling is, is going to be important for you guys. But the most important thing that I would say is that both of you guys want the same thing which is a, a deeper relationship and a better understanding with each other. And it's going to be hard and it's going to be confusing and all kinds of stuff is going to come up as you guys walk this journey. But as long as you guys walk it together and y'all lean on each other, y'all are going to be fine. Any last thoughts or questions? I would say one thing is, and we need to understand Zach better. Yep. And that's one thing as he matured and uh, entered adulthood, his interests became different than than mine. Mm -hmm. So that was one area where uh, we we started to, or he became more um, in, isolated, I guess from the family and his interests were different. For example, gaming, you know, yeah, I've done some Xbox games a few times, big deal. Uh, I don't understand his perspective on gaming and the att attraction with it and satisfaction, fulfillment with it. And that's just one example of our differences, understanding those and appreciating those and respecting each other with those different interests, but yet how can we find something in common and have that relationship with those differences. Sure. So I, I think these are ongoing conversations. And yeah. I think at the end of the day, Dave, it's, you know, my, my first instinct in response to that would be that, you know, it is important for you to understand gaming. I think that's a really important discussion um, for, 
Actually, I think it's the most important discussion for our particular community because parents don't understand. Um, and we don't do a good job as kids explaining it to our parents. And it's a two-way street. Yeah, I, I would say at the end of the day, though, understanding, I, I think Zach wants to understand you better as well. And it, it's not so much about interests and stuff. I, I think sharing some of what you did today, and I, I know Zach has been working through a lot of stuff. And, and Zach, hopefully, you know, you can, you feel comfortable enough to convey some of the things that you're thinking through with your parents and, and what your motivations and thoughts are around some of that stuff. Um, but I, I think just keep communicating and hopefully y'all will get there. <laughs> thoughts on family counseling thing? I think y'all should do family counseling. I, th I think it's nice to have someone to facilitate communication because it's hard, right? Like, like it's hard because I think your dad had something really, really important to say, and it took him a couple of tries to be able to say it in a way that you could hear. So it's not just like he has to say, say it the right way. It's like about the way that you're, you're, you hear things too. And so sometimes you'll need a little bit of a nudge until you learn how to do it on your own. Sound good? Take care. Thank you. <laughs> you too. Strong work, really. Strong work today. Adios. Bye-bye. Okay. Damn.